Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 669. Five more popular myths about weight loss. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Uh, I'm Dr. Kathy Moppet, and today we are going to talk about more myths that we have believed at some point, and uh, maybe you still believe, that tell us lies about how to lose weight for the benefit of our health. So the reason behind most of these is either ignorance or that these these beliefs have been hanging around since before the research was done that dispelled the myths, but nobody told us that, that the myths have been proven wrong. Um, a lot of these have to do with what you're told by your doctor or by your government. And unfortunately, most doctors haven't really learned anything since they were in medical school, so consider how old they are and then, and then consider the fact that their advice is 20, 30, 40 years old. So I'm just giving you the most recent research that then gives you the truth about how to manage your diet and exercise to stay healthy and to lose your extra fat. Um, We all have some extra fat because we're in America, and in America, portions are big, and um, serving food and getting people to eat food and to be addicted to carbohydrates makes money. So, you know, follow the dollar. So that's the problem with listening to ads about weight loss, ads that sell something. They're either selling something so you can lose weight or they're telling you something uh, is good for you when it isn't and it is going to cause you to lose weight. So you can't really believe the ads. That's all profit motivated. Um, Can't believe the government because that's also profit motivated. Some America grows grain, and grain is one of the biggest carbohydrates that causes us to gain weight. So sadly, um, we are told things by the FDA and by our, our governmental agencies that make us gain weight and not lose weight. And they are the um, authors of the food pyramid that was wrong, that we shouldn't have the largest, the largest portion of that pyramid be carbohydrates. That is not healthy for us. We should have protein as our primary building block of our bodies. That should be the largest part of our diet. And we should not have carbohydrates be even the next, fat should be the next level, that should be the next most important food. And carbohydrates should be reserved for eating that before exercise or before um, any type of physical um, physical activity like hiking, that gives you energy for movement. It is not about making you healthier. It doesn't do much for our bodies except give us energy. And we can get energy from fat and protein as well. So let's talk about some of the things that you might have been told by your doctor. Um, Myth number one in this series is that salt is bad for you, and you should limit your intake to the most minuscule amount of salt. Well, a large study um, found, so the large study was 600 patient years of um, taking of salt intake, and they looked at people who had a limited salt intake, and they compared them to people who had a normal salt intake. I'm not talking about people who, like, eat the entire salt shaker. Some people are overdo it and that causes high blood pressure. But if you're just a normal person salting your food or um, eating a few chips here and there that have salt on them, then that is just moderate salt. They compared moderate salt intake to low salt intake. And they found that the um, mortality went up by 25% in people who limited their salt. 
So we've been told the exact wrong thing. If you're just a normal person who doesn't oversalt their food, then you are going to be healthier and live longer than people who limit their salt. We need salt for lots of things in our body. It, it actually helps us maintain our water salt base in our blood, in our, in our tissues. We actually need salt as electrolytes uh, to make our muscles work. So if we don't have enough salt, we feel tired and we feel limp because we need salt to actually move and, and uh, participate in activities or even just walk around. You need salt for that. Without it, we're tired and our muscles don't have enough energy to contract and therefore it is really not good for us and it causes us to die early if we don't have enough salt. So that's a very important electrolyte for us to, um, to uh, replace or to have in our diet. The AHA, American Health Association, preaches that a low-salt diet keeps you living longer, but that's just a myth. It's a lie. Um, myth number two, replacing your hormones at menopause, estradiol and testosterone specifically, will cause women to gain weight. Well, that's simply not true, uh, it, but it does depend on the, the way you take your estrogen and the way you take your testosterone. But first of all, when we hit menopause, whether it be when we're 42 or when we're 55, when we are, have all of our ovaries, they're, they're gone. They don't work anymore. And our, our, so our ovaries are not working. We don't make estrogen. We don't make testosterone or progesterone. When that happens, it's a cataclysmic kind of event, and our body's metabolism slows down. It just slows down so that we are all, all women who have gone through menopause, sensitive to carbohydrates. We can eat fewer carbohydrates after menopause than we could before. We gain weight easier. We don't, we get low blood sugar when we're eating carbohydrates. We feel that a lot more after menopause and we gain a ton of belly fat. Now that's if we don't take any hormones. If we take hormones in a non-oral delivery system, and that means pellets like what I do, or patches, or gels, or vag tabs. Any way to get estrogen in your body without swallowing it will help you lose weight. It will make you less insulin resistant. And testosterone in a non-oral fashion will, do, will augment that. So if you're taking both of them, that at least helps you get back to a younger metabolism. And that is that's found in many, many research articles. Um, that is something that we do in our practice. We use that as our foundation so that patients are going to make muscle and lose fat by testosterone stimulating muscle and estrogen making them more insulin sensitive. Now, once we do that, if a patient then has problems losing weight, then we start looking for thyroid deficiencies. And we start looking for other things that can cause them to continue to be the same weight or gain weight. That usually has to do with lifestyle choices, how, what they eat, how much they exercise, uh, how much they uh, sleep, how much, they, uh, how much stress they're under, how little they exercise. And that's huge. When you're talking about weight loss, it's a, it's a component that you have to comply with to actually get down to your ideal weight. When all else fails, we now have a new thing, a new tool in our toolbox for weight loss, and that is the uh, Ozempic, Mongero, Wagovi um, type drugs, which will, when given once a week, which will decrease hunger, which will increase um, insulin sensitivity, it will decrease the um, insulin resistance and the overproduction of insulin. And therefore, it will help, after you've done all these other things, it will then help patients who are have their hormones back and are f living a good, healthy lifestyle to lose their weight and get down to ideal weight. And it works. But there's another myth out there about this. They say, oh, well, I don't want to be on this my whole life. Well, some people don't have to be on this their whole life. They get down to ideal weight. They continue the lifestyle that they've been following as they lost weight. They continue their hormone replacement. 
and they can stay at that ideal weight. There are others of us that need to get down to ideal weight, wean off one of these injectable medications for weight loss, and then go on metformin to help them with their insulin resistance. Because sometimes insulin resistance doesn't just go away. Sometimes it comes back when we're off these drugs and we need to not gain the weight back. So it's lifestyle, meaning exercise and eating properly. It's hormones. And it is um, sometimes medication. So these are the things that we use in my office to bring menopausal women back to health that they had when they were much younger. Um, actually, one of the best things about getting testosterone after age 40 is that your, as your testosterone drops, your muscle mass drops, and you aren't able to build more muscle. Muscle mass is, is inherent in weight loss. Your muscles burn 90% of your calories, 90%. If your muscles are asleep, they don't have any testosterone, you're not able to build muscle, they aren't being worked out because you're so tired, because your mus every time you work out, your muscles are fatigued and you're fatigued, you stop working out. When we give people testosterone, their muscles wake up and they burn calories. They make muscle as they lose fat. All diets after menopause, if you don't have testosterone, you're going to lose muscle and fat. That's not a good thing because you're left with less muscle and that's bad for osteoporosis. That's bad for your ability to get around, but it's also bad for your ability to burn calories. You just lost your engine that you were, that was burning your calories for you. So it is very important to do all of these things, get to ideal weight, and then see if you can go off these meds or if you can go on to um, metformin in its place. If you can, that's great. Some people have to be on a very low dose of one of these drugs, and we recommend compounded versions of these drugs to save people money, but at a very low dose so that what would normally be a cost for three months when you're on maintenance might be a cost. The cost for three months is like five sixty for and that's cheap compared to the pharmaceutical cost. That would be something that could be stretched out over six months, so that makes it half as expensive at, at, when you're using it for maintenance. So it is doable, and it should be used if you can't lose weight through, lose fat through lifestyle changes, hormones, and um, exercise. Okay, the next myth is, one of my favorites, milk products, all of them, cow milk products, are bad for you and you should take them out of your diet. This is a very popular myth right now. Now, I will tell you there are exceptions to this, that actually there are certain people that are allergic to milk, or they have celiac disease, or they have some other type of mucosal disruption in their gut who can't drink milk or eat milk products of any kind without developing inflammation. But they already have a dysfunction. Milk for people who are healthy, and I don't, I don't mean that they are, that you have to drink milk out of a carton. I'm talking about milk and milk products. Milk is a vital source of calcium. It's a vital source of protein. It's a vital source that is easy to eat and it is portable and you can uh, have cheese and crackers and that can be uh, a snack for you and it'll be a high protein snack with some fat that keeps you satiated. So milk as a food, as a milk product, yogurt for instance, is very healthy and it's very good for you to eat it unless you're allergic to it or have one of these other conditions. In general, milk products are very well um, tolerated and are good for you. Now, milk as a milk, milk as a liquid, that is in a carton that you get at the store has been altered. From the cow, after it is then collected, whole milk takes off the cream. They use that for um, heavy, heavy cream. Then it is, it is heated, pasteurized, so that you don't get any bacteria, and that kills off the uh, enzymes that break down milk in your stomach and in your gut that make it healthy. Then they also put other chemicals into milk to um, homogenize it and to make it 
so you don't have to, to make it um, thick, so you don't have to shake it up every time to get the cream to disperse in it. It makes it last longer on the shelf. So that's a, um, that's a process that we use to make it friendly to the grocer and to keep in your house longer. However, milk should be healthy for most of us, uh, but without when, when they put milk through all this process to make it safe, then it isn't as healthy for some of us who have lactose intolerance because the lactase has been taken out of that milk. Now, some milk, you can add the lactase back in, and that, that's a special kind of milk that tells you that it's for people who are lactose intolerant. However, you don't have to drink milk to get the benefit of milk. You can have yogurt. You can have any of the cheeses, cream cheese. You can have sour cream. You can, I mean, there are many different forms of of uh, milk, even ricotta cheese, which is sometimes sheep from sheep, but oftentimes in this country it's from cow milk. All of those are very important to us and should be in our diet unless we have a specific problem that causes milk to be inflammatory. It's just like any other allergy. Some people can eat peanuts, some people can't. Some people can have milk products, some people can't. If milk makes you feel bad, you probably shouldn't, or have gas, or have diarrhea, you probably shouldn't have whatever form of milk that was. And then try the other forms and see if, you're, if that makes you sick. If it doesn't, then you can have those other forms of milk. It's not a blanket statement. If you can't tolerate, that doesn't mean you can't tolerate yogurt or you can't tolerate sour cream. So that theory that milk is bad for you or milk products are bad for you is really just not true. It's just true for a, a minority, a very small minority of the population. So second to the last myth is skim milk is better for everyone than whole milk. And those people on a diet should opt for skim milk. Well, skim milk doesn't have any vitamin D, whole milk does. Skim milk doesn't have any... Um, doesn't have enough fat to make you feel full, satiated, so you drink more of it. And skim milk has 55% carbohydrate, while whole milk has a carbohydrate percentage of 30%. So more carbohydrate in skim milk with less quality food in it. It doesn't have the fat to make you feel full, you drink more skim milk, and it doesn't have vitamin D. So that's basically a good reason to drink whole milk. And you just don't drink a lot because it does have milk sugar in it. You don't want to have too much carbohydrate with your protein and your fat. So having whole milk is preferential, is, is better for you than having skim milk. So no, skim milk is not healthier for you. It's just a higher carbohydrate food. So you should just avoid that and have whole milk, just a smaller amount. The last, um, but probably I'll have a, another six of these after, um, after a while as my patients come in and complain about different diets they've been on. The last, last myth is that cutting out animal products in your diet, like eggs, cheese, meat, fish, that cutting those out of your diet will lower your cholesterol and decrease your risk of heart disease. This is just not true. We, that's what we've been told because it was based on, oh, fat is in the cholesterol deposits in, on your arteries when you have atherosclerosis, which is then leads to narrowing of your arteries and heart attack. However, just because there's fat in the deposits on your arteries does not mean it came from fat or animal products that have cholesterol in them. Because it's cholesterol and fat, it doesn't mean you ate cholesterol and fat. That is produced by your liver from all kinds of foods. And now we know that it is mostly produced by carbohydrate foods. So if you want to lower your cholesterol, you should cut out carbohydrates and simple sugars and processed foods, not animal products. The, one, of the, um, one of my patients who's, by, because of religious reasons, has never had any animal products, 
has one of the worst cases of atherosclerosis at an early age that I've se ever seen. So that's why we can't really go by some of the things I was taught in medical school because obviously it's cholesterol in the, in the uh, atherosclerosis on the vessel. It should be, it came from the food that has cholesterol in it. That's just not true. The liver makes cholesterol. You don't have to have any kind of animal product to make cholesterol uh, atherosclerotic plaque. So that's hopefully news to you and you will not uh, stop eating animal products because we were built for eating a variety of things, not just one thing, not just one type of food like vegetables, not just, as my, as my COO, um, Joe Ballman says, if we were supposed to just eat vegetables, we would have teeth like a cow and they would all be molars. That's when I went, oh, we're not, our incisors are built for eating meat. And that's what we were built for. If you were built like a cow with seven stomachs and you could eat um, grass all day or green stuff all day, then you would have different kind of teeth and you would be built for it. So just take that that lie out of your uh, rep repertoire and start eating a balanced animal product plus fruit and vegetables plus a small amount of grains and that will be an ideal type of food plan for you to lose weight. We can always help. We can always help with medication and one of the biggest helps we could do, we can help if you're very frustrated and you've tried all these things and you've been told the wrong advice is to Come get a, um, a genetic test. It's, you never have to do it again. You just do it once and find out how much of each type of food you should eat. Like, I never dreamed that my genetic plan would require that I eat 30% fat. Fat. Who knew that? And everything else is protein and carbohydrates. But that's my primary food. That's by my genetics. I, fo I now follow that now that I know it. And then that makes eating a lot less uh, guilt-producing when I'm eating butter or I'm eating sour cream. So don't be guilty. Just follow the rule, follow the advice, and not what you've been told in the past that is, has been disproved. And uh, try to get to your ideal weight with using all the tools that you have. I don't want you to un eat foods you don't like. I want you to eat food you like. Just eat a variety of foods. Thank you for listening. I hope this helps you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.